it's the after lunch slot. Um, right, so as, as um, Elizabeth said, I'll talk for a bit about protecting children's beneficial family relationships. And, um, but before I do, I'm just going to um, mention my father because it would have been his birthday today. Um, he would have been 103 if he was alive. Um, he was an engineer, a war hero, a D-Day survivor, a refugee, and above all, he was a wonderful dad. So I just thought today was appropriate to remember him. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about who we are first. Who are FNF? Well, we were established 45 years ago, 1974. We're a registered charity. Um, we're there for dads, mums, grandparents, uh, but with, their families need fathers because the, the problems we deal with tend to affect dads by, above all. And we really think that both parents matter for the children, and that's really important. Um, we have a vision that every child matters and will benefit from a presumption of having both of their parents in their life, unless there is a good reason not to. Um, we believe in joint inclusive parenting. Um, we, we think that, well, we, we, we think there's plenty of evidence that children benefit from both of their children, and, unless there is a very good reason for them not to. And our mission is to try and further the cause of that happening. And I'm not going to go through the detail of the slide here, but because some of it we'll cover a little bit later on. Um, our main services that we offer are, we have a helpline which people contact. We have almost 30,000 callers every year to our helpline. Uh, mostly people are pretty desperate to get some support after family separation. Um, I, can't, I have to mention that Pauline Green, one of our helpline volunteers, last year got the award from the Helpline Partnership for Best Volunteer of the Year. Um, we have a website which has over half a million visits a year. Um, we have a branch network of about 30 branches in England. Uh, there are separate charity organisations, sister charities, if you like, in Wales and Scotland, which, have, which offer support as well. About 5,000 people attend our branches, and we have an online forum, which includes solicitor help, where people can go onto a specific section and get some kind of basic support. Um, why do people come to us? Well, there are over 50,000 private law applications a year. And the majority of them are from fathers wanting to see their children after separation. They involve 125,000 children. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the loss of legal aid, but since legal aid disappeared in 2013, um, the number of litigants in person has been growing. I mean, I don't know what it was in 2012-13. I didn't find a figure, but the Magistrates Association um, talked about 2014, 41%, and now something like... 68% in 2017 who are on their own without a lawyer in front of a judge, usually for the first time, having, having never set foot in a court before. Government policy has been to discourage people from going to court. They wanted people to resolve things increasingly through mediation. Unfortunately, all their policy decisions that they've made so far have had exactly the opposite effect. Their policies on legal aid and, um, and even them introducing legal, um, sorry, and, um, introducing the requirement to go into mediation before an application is made to family court, all of those things you would have thought were going to increase um, mediation, actually they've had the effect of reducing it by more than half. Absolutely disastrous. Um, and court orders, when you do eventually get them, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, are very often not complied with, as I'm sure a lot of you will have heard about. So there's almost 8,000 applications a year now for enforcement of those orders. And you will have heard about the courts having the powers to find the non-compliant parent, about um, making special arrangements and so on. They just don't use those powers. They're far too complex to introduce, to agree, um, and to enforce. And, and judges also don't like to punish the parent who's got the care of the child. So the powers that are there, the ministers always say, well, the courts have the powers. The reality is they're hardly ever used. People also come to us because they trust us, because we, they know that we are coming from the perspective of an organization that's trying to provide help for those who are struggling with, in, in that situation. And above all, you know, we often, we often hear about deadbeat dads who don't look after their kids, don't pay their child maintenance. Well, 
they exist, of course, but the, the thousands of people who come to us are not coming to us because they want nothing to do with their children. They're coming to us because their children are the most important thing in their life. Um, a little bit about, you know, who's doing it right. Well, you know, there, there's a mixed pattern all over the world, but I will talk a little bit about Scandinavian countries because they have made particular progress. They are now where we were about... Where, we are now where they were about 50 years ago in terms of arrangements for children after family separation. We're just beginning to scratch at the surface of some of the policies that matter in that. Things like paternity leave, which I'll again mention a bit more later. Um, and just to illustrate that a little bit, in, uh, until recently, the government and Kafkas and others were saying that only about 10% of people went to court. We challenged that. We challenged that and challenged it because it didn't ring true. They did some new analysis in the last sort of six months, and they have now accepted that it's not 10%, it's 38% who go to court. That's a very big difference. Government was making policy on the basis of a load of nonsense, if you excuse, excuse the expression. But 38% in the UK is the figure. In Sweden, it's 2%. Okay, so we have to start thinking, why is that? Um, mediation in Sweden is 14%, and 84% sort things out amongst themselves. That's fairly impressive. Really, we really have to understand what's going on over there. And we also wonder, you know, that we think that there are a lot of parents who give up before they've started. They assume they need a lawyer. They don't need a lawyer, but they assume they need a lawyer to go to, to, to try and get a contact order. Um, many of them won't bother because they don't have the money to get a lawyer. £250 an hour or more. It's not very easy if you're on benefits or on not, not, not earning an income. Um, what happened in Sweden and some of those other Scandinavian countries, though, to do this? The assumption is often made that culture is different, they're just a different kind of people. Well, maybe, but they weren't a different kind of people in the 1970s. They were very similar to us. And what changed was when in the 70s they introduced legislation um, on equality, they took equality far, far more seriously than we ever did in the UK. Um, and that meant, for example, that they began to int introduce policies on paternity leave as to be the same as maternity leave, or very close to it. They started to increase involvement of fathers in children's lives from a very early stage. Um, and those policies resulted in a growth in the number of, the, the, of, the number of people having 50-50 care after separation of about 1% a year. And that's now been going on for some 40 years. So now the majority, in most cases, it's unusual when parents separate for them not to share care on a 50-50 basis. And it's probably just worth mentioning that, you know, we talk about gender pay gaps. Um, we are, again, compared to the Scandinavians, in a very different place in terms of the benefits that parents get. So two parents on 27,500 average income who both work. Um, mum goes on maternity leave. The state level of support to the maternity leave will be about £7,500. The state support for fathers to be involved in the early life of their children is £297 spread over two weeks, a 96% gender support gap. So we are hardly in a place of really promoting fatherhood. And it might be just worth mentioning that Finland in 2017 became the first country in the world where fathers actually spent more time caring for their children than mothers. Not a great deal more, eight minutes a day. In essence, they've achieved equality. But, it's a, it, but you know, they, they have a government which is half of the cabinet is women, sometimes more. Um, and they speak about policies to promote the involvement of both parents. And that comes out of all the ministers' mouths all the time. So what are the effects of that? Well, no small study in Sweden, and I'm just showing you one slide, there are a whole sort of tranche of slides showing similar sort of figures. They, they have a large scale sample where they looked at a huge group of, you know, we're talking over 100,000 children of a particular age group, and looked at their mental health problems that they had based on whether they were in a nuclear family, whether they were in joint parental care, essentially 50-50, mostly in the care of one parent and those in sole care. And what you see is that, of course, nuclear family, they have, there's a sort of the benchmark, but only a small degradation of mental health, risk of mental health when they're in joint parental care, 
15% increase in the likelihood of mental health problems if they're in most care, and if they're in the sole care of one parent, they've got almost a third greater chance of having mental health difficulties. Um, I'm not going to go through the small print of the other things, but basically the Scandinavians and a few other nations very much rely on research, and it basically says that, look, even in fairly high-conflict families, the benefit is there for the children of having the involvement of both parents from an early age. So what, what can be done? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but we think that there's a need for something such as in Florida, they have these things called standing temporary orders. It means that when parents separate, unless there is a reason that's given, a good reason of perhaps some sort of abusive behavior, there should be a standing temporary order, an automatic order which says that there will be a minimum amount of time that the child is going to spend with the other parent. And if that's going to be challenged, it needs to be challenged straight away and seen by a judge straight away. Um, we also want early intervention. You know, we, the, the, the lack of, well, again, I'll talk more about this, the fact that at the moment it can take months to get a court order when you go to a family court. Well, months for a child that's one year old, three years old, six years old, six months or 12 months delay is no use to anybody. By that time, the relationship is damaged. If that child is very young, they can barely remember the other parent by the time that they get their order, assuming it is obeyed. Um, parental alienation is the single biggest complaint that comes to us. Um, this is when a parent either deliberately or sometimes unwittingly causes a child to reject the other parent through their behavior in relation to that child. And I'll come back to that a little bit more. Enforcement I've already touched on. Uh, domestic abuse allegations, we heard a lot about that this morning. But again, we think it's really critical that there is a speedy investigation. Currently, it takes often months to get a hearing, a fact finding, a fact hearing, to establish the reality as to whether or not that contact is safe. Um, and I'll talk more about non molestation orders as well. Um, and we think parents would benefit to understanding what the paramountcy principle is because, you know, a lot of parents assume that they have rights. Well, the rights are the child's. And, and that's right and proper, but there needs to be an understanding. We heard from um, Mick earlier about um, a parent being pestered by the other parents. Well, the people we hear from, the pestering that occasionally we do hear about, is the pestering of saying, when can I see my son or my daughter or the children? That's the pestering. And what they don't realize is that if the other parent says, I don't want you to email me or contact me, then it only takes two texts once they've told them that to get that non-molestation order, to get an injunctive order which says you can't. And then your only option is to go to court. So back to LASPO, this um, Legal Aid Sentencing Punishment of Offenders Act 212, enacted in 13. Well, it ended legal aid in private family law with the exception of cases involving allegations of domestic abuse. Now, earlier, Mick stood here and talked, talk, I think he must have used the word victim about 50 times. The, these are all alleged victims, and the perpetrators are at this point alleged perpetrators. The word alleged was missing from his entire talk, which I think is a great shame because the assumption is that the person who makes the allegation is always telling the truth and the whole truth. Not necessarily the case. Um, and what's happened with this change in legislation, whilst it's clearly well intended, the intention was to... Um, ensure that people who genuinely are victims, who have been coer subject of coercive control and who have been battered or beaten or in other ways maltreated, that they have some protection. But actually what's happened is that the balance has tipped, that the evidence level, as, as Mick said, is a statement, or a single statement, is sufficient to get from the, from the person making the complaint, is sufficient to get that non-molestation order with an injunction attached for which you can get a five-year uh, sentence if they breach it in a criminal record. Um, I won't talk too much about the balance of probabilities. Mick did that earlier. Um, a lot of the hearings, about half of the hearings on non-molestation orders are issued without notice, where one party is absent. And we talked about the potential consequences of breaching that order. Um, non-molestation orders have become the favored route to getting legal aid in family court. So if you're on low income, or if you um, have no income, or if you're on benefits, um, or if you are a, um, 
a, a sing, for want of inverted commas, single parent, if you're the carer who's not in work, um, then the allegation will be sufficient to qualify you for legal aid, which will be worth thousands of pounds to you, and will only be available to the complainant and not to the person making the application to court um, who, or the defendant of the allegation. They will not get that legal aid. They will not be supported. They are on their own. So uh, this has had a very significant effect and a very significant dynamic in what happens. Now, non-molestation orders, which we heard about this morning, well, they have increased since the law changed by 47% um, in the last 12 months compared to when the legislation was changed. If you just took, take the last quarter up to June, they've increased by 57.5% non-molestation orders too. So now we've got annually nearly 30,000 such orders and it used to be under 20. Um, and I might as well just mention here that um, we're here in Derby. Derby has actually had the single biggest growth of non-molestation orders in the whole of the United Kingdom. It's increased in that time by about a thousand percent, a tenfold increase. And the reason I mention that is partly not just because we're in Derby, but because, um, because um, one of the suggestions is one of the suggestions is that you know I've talked to various organisations. So, so well, what do you think is the reason for this growth? And some of the domestic abuse agencies say, well. Women in particular are becoming much more aware of domestic abuse and violence and so on and so on. I'm sure there's some truth in that. At the same time, it doesn't explain why, for example, in Wales, the number has gone down. In London, the number has gone down. In the Midlands, it's gone up by over 150%. In Derby, it's gone up by 1,000%. You've got huge variations by region with very local spikes. Some of those spikes are involved with just individual courts. We've, we've got freedom of access information requests that we have uh, had inf data from, which broke it down by individual courts and even by individual law firms. So we know that there are individual law firms, individual domestic violence agencies, which are driving those figures, you know, where one, one, one year they were doing 50 cases a year, next thing they're doing 500 um, after the change in legislation on legal aid. So there are issues. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that the issues of domestic abuse are not always straightforward. The suggestion that it's kind of always a victim and a perpetrator, it's not that simple, and I'll come back to that a little bit more. Um, I think we need to understand a lot more about the nature of domestic abuse, and particularly in relation to Family Separation and Children Act proceedings. There's very little known for, as facts. There was a study carried out by Women's Aid and CAFGAS um, a couple of years ago, which suggested that 62% of, um, of family court applications involved featured allegations of abuse. That's from either party. Um, so there was a very small study in Scotland, in Strathclyde University, which found, actually made a study of about 100 odd people, a bit over 100 people, and found that in 70% of cases, the court actually found that they were fabricated or judged to be false. Um, Erin Pitsey, who set up the first women's refuge in the world and was as credited as being the founder of Women's Aid, wrote a paper where she talked about how 62% of the women who came to her refuge um, were as, as, as violent or more violent than the men they were seeking refuge from. Now, um, that, that doesn't mean, of course, that they didn't deserve the support of the refuge and that she, she certainly offered it. Uh, but it means that the problem is more complex. And here's the but. The but is that most of this work that has been done has been on pretty small-scale studies. There's been very little analysis of actual findings of the court as opposed to allegations made. Um, nationally, we know that in the, in, the, in the Ministry of Justice survey that they carry out, 35% um, of allegations are, are by men. Our experience is that men tend not to complain, particularly, especially in the context of family separation. Because if you're not the parent who's living with the chill child or children, then your objective is to try to see your children as your paramount objective, the thing that you really want to happen. If you start making complaints to the police or other authorities of being the victim of abuse, that's only going to set, increase the temperature in the situation and you're going to be... You, you, the first thing that will happen is that your contact arrangement will be stopped and it will be stopped until a court, at least until a court makes a decision and that will be months and months and months away. Um, 
And there's a lot of myths. So there's a lack of understanding about the nature of abuse, and there's a lack of understanding of parental alienation as well. And I think um, it's just worth mentioning here, maybe that you know, right now we've got domestic abuse um, and domestic violence and abuse bill that's going through Parliament. Lots of decisions are being made. An inquiry is being held into the into domestic abuse, uh, domestic protection. Excuse me, protection in family courts. Um, but those inquiries are being led essentially without a base of proper understanding of the situation. There's very little research about the issues that I've just touched on to actually understand the nature of domestic abuse. Um, uh, most of it is being supported by organizations that subscribe to a gendered view of domestic abuse. Professor Liz Trinder um, has from Exeter University did quite a lot of work and a lot of it, the most recent published work was about fault-based divorce and she made a very strong re report recommending that we should get rid of fault-based divorce. In her report she quotes uh, the Law Commission saying the system still allows even encourages the parties to lie or at least exaggerate in order to get what they want. Um, a legal advisor said, I mean, the system at the moment can easily be manipulated. It's not as though there's many checks in the system. I mean, there's no checks made of what people write on a form anyway, is there really? We're not verifying what they're saying at all. And she concludes in her report, parties often feel under pressure to exaggerate allegations into one of the legal facts, which is what they need to, to get speed up their divorce. But if, those are the, if people are prepared to do all of those things when their motives are simply to speed up their divorce proceedings, how much more are they prepared to do when, it's, when they've been told that, they, that when they don't want their child to see the other parent, when, when the emotional issues are so much more heightened, when it also means that they might get legal aid worth thousands of pounds and otherwise be on their own? Now, um, hard to go through all of this, but I just thought, you know, I'm, this can be shared afterwards, but I thought I'd just give some scenarios because these are kind of more real examples of the sort of things that we hear about. So, for example, uh, we're, you know, these are sort of situations that we are contacted in. After separation, all was working well. When the mother got a new boyfriend, all contact was stopped. She no longer needed a babysitter. When the father got a new girlfriend, the girlfriend, mum first insisted that he, he could only have the children in, in, in her own presence or without the other partner there. And when that wasn't agreed, stopped contact. Um, when, when dad lost his job and reduced child maintenance, my mum said no money, no contact. I mean, this is real world stuff. This is what happens when emotions are involved and people are deciding what they're going to do. Sometimes, you know, you've got mum beat dad regularly. Um, and when he plucked up the carriage to the police, she alleged that he was the abuser. These facts need to be established. They can't be taken at face value. Um, you know, both parents smoked cannabis in front of the child, perhaps. And then suddenly they've separated. The allegation is he smokes cannabis in front of the child. Well, so what? Is a decision going to be made to remove the child from both parents? Um, father reported the mother to social services when a drug dealer moved in with her. And then she assaulted him when he came to collect the kids and called the police and claimed abuse. Mum suffers from mental health condition. That means that she, fi she, she finds it difficult to see things with clarity. Or she maybe herself has been a victim of horrendous abuse and is fearful that that's how everybody behaves. Now, these, um, I've put these in rather gendered terms because we're mostly talking to dads. It could have happened just as much the other way around. The issue is that courts need evidence and they need to establish on the balance of probability, which is the low threshold that they use, as to whether or not who's telling the truth, who is more credible than the other person. Whilst we're on the subject, jealousy plays a big part in many of the things that we hear about, and I thought I'd just mention, mention Sir Walter Raleigh, a bit of light relief. He was 27 when he met uh, Queen Elizabeth, who was at the time 40. She was very fond of him, no suggestion that it was an intimate relationship, or at least not that we know of. But there was another Elizabeth who 10 years later came into his life, Elizabeth, or Bess Throckmorton. She was the lady in the middle. And they had a child together and got married without, in, in secret. A, a, a year later, the queen um, found out about it. And what did she do? She put them both in the tower, of course. Um, 
jealousy plays a part at, if, wherever you come from in life. She did, in the end, release him because um, I think she found him of more value with her and supporting her than on the inside of the tower. Sir James Munby, the former president of the family division, said at one of our conferences, the vice of the system so often is that an applicant alleging domestic violence of some sort goes to court without giving notice, gets an order, some would say for the asking, the court doesn't give the respondent a date. If the respondent gets a hearing, the thing is just rolled over and is very unsatisfactory to say the least. And all too often, at an ex parte, an ex parte injunction is granted at the outset and it sets the tone for the entire subsequent proceedings. And I have to touch on parental alienation. As I said, this is kind of, you know, you can imagine. It's not, sometimes it's very deliberate poisoning of a child against a parent, and we hear about that quite a lot. But sometimes it can be quite unwitting. It can be that a child goes and has a lovely time with, I'm going to say, Dad. It can be, as I say, totally the other way around. It's not a gendered issue. It happens to mums too. But a, a child will go and have a lovely time with Dad. They'll come back home and be asked, so what happened? What did you do? And so we had a great time. We went to the fun fair, we did this, we did that, we then went to Nando's, blah, blah, blah. If mum is at home with tears running down her face, looking upset, looking up across, that child learns very quickly. And they'll know, next time, they've upset mum. So next time they go and see dad, and they come home, what did you do? It was boring. He had a phone call, which may be true. Might have been a one minute phone call. Sorry, I don't have time I've, with my kids. I can't talk now. But the child will report back. No, he spent all the time on the phone. We did nothing. Mum is now either pleased or frightfully concerned that their child, her child, is having a terrible time whilst at dad's. She's just got all the ammunition she wants to go back to the judge and say, No, my child hates it. They don't. They don't want to be put in the middle. They don't want to be the ones who have the pressure put on them. And I should just mention, there have been two cases reported in the last couple of weeks in the, in, 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 on Bailey. In, in the, one is, I think, Reh, where the judge ordered a transfer of residency after some years. The other one that was reported last week uh, was um, Judge Wildblood, who after eight years decided he was going to stop making any attempts at reuniting the child, where clearly all the professionals, lots of experts along the way of eight years, were clear that alienation is what was happening. This child was being poisoned against their dad. The father was of impeccable, unimpeachable um, nature. But they decided they couldn't do anything. Of course they could, but they couldn't do it and wait for six, seven, eight years to start doing it. By then it was too late. So I just want to talk a little bit about the process of what we experience in family court and what, what sort of intervention might help. Tip, you know, when, when contact stops, when people split up and, and contact is stopped, they might try to negotiate for a number of weeks or months with their ex. If they get nowhere, they might suggest mediation. They might do it of their own back, or they might, somebody might suggest it, or might, they might realise that it's something they have to do before they make an application to court that might delay things for another few weeks. Then if they don't, without a lawyer who can fairly speedily help them with their C125 page application form, it might take them a few weeks to get that done, maybe to get some advice and help from somebody, maybe come to us to, to get somebody to look at their form. Kafkas, when they receive that form, will do safeguarding checks, which for some reason seem to take at least six weeks. In Belgium, they seem to manage to get a court order in a week but hey, there we go, we haven't quite got to the bottom of why it, seems, why it has to take that long in this country. Once they've done the safeguarding checks, they, so they'll set a date. They might do it in parallel, so if you're lucky, you'll get it in a couple of weeks. If you're not, it might take another 10 weeks before you get a first hearing date. At that first hearing, nothing is going to be decided. It'll probably be a half an hour, 45 minute hearing, um, unless it's by consent. So unless the parent with care at that point agrees, no decision, nothing, no contact. Um, they will then set a date probably for a directions hearing, which will be some more weeks down the line. At which point, they, they, and maybe they will ask for statements to be given to the court and so on, and then the court will decide based on those statements whether they need a finding of fact, if there were some allegations of abusive behaviour. You can see this process is now, and this is a sim relatively simple process, some are much more complex, and it's lasted half a year. Allegations can be made at any point. They go into mediation. 
if somebody makes an allegation during, in, during the course of mediation, the mediators, will, in 90% of cases, they will say, we can no longer assist you. We have to step back from the mediation. You have to go back to court. Um, they might do the allegation when the safeguarding checks, when Kafka's phone and contact, and suddenly they think of something. But it could be, of course, that they were in a mutually abusive relationship. It could be that there was an incident which was years ago, maybe even before this relationship started, maybe involving somebody else, but suddenly it's thrown out as an allegation of abuse, which suddenly has taken on a great enormity. And maybe in some cases it has, but not, this is what then needs to be investigated. So the question then becomes, all these things add delay and delay and delay, and cases end up rumbling for months and years. These are not child-appropriate timescales. Our justice system is not designed to support young children and the time frames which are appropriate. It simply fails unless the parents are cooperative and collaborative in some way. Now, we think that there's a really crucial role here for children contact centers, and we need to be thinking about how we get there, because actually what we would like to see is when families fall out, unless there's some very serious incident, and that's been very quickly established that there's something that's sufficiently serious, that contact has to be stopped completely, we would rather it was in a contact center, under supervision or under su support of some sort, so that the contact isn't broken. And that needs to happen in weeks after the contact is stopped, not months. At the moment, Kafkas won't make a recommendation until somewhere near the end of that line. By that time, damage has been done. Everybody's angry, everybody's worked up. The child has not seen the parents for, for months. That's not good enough. That's not a system there for children. That's a system for its own, that serves itself. So we very much think that what we need is to work out a system of early triage, early intervention, early decisions, and maybe even at that first, if it can't be done earlier, if it can be done earlier, then great, right up front. But if it can't be done straight away, and if we can't get to Florida-style standing temporary orders, then maybe at least at the point, you know, once shorten that safeguarding process, number one, and even so, even whilst that's going on, Get the contact going in a contact center so it's safe, so nobody feels threatened. Everybody has to feel safe. Um, I think I've had my time, um, so I, I won't go on. There's, a, there's some leaflets if anybody wants, and please feel free. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's things which I would have liked to have mentioned which I didn't, but that's how it goes. And I think I love the fact that you're highlighting that there's 100,000 children who are losing contact with their parents every week. It's terribly damaging. It needs to change, and we need to change that. Um, and we have also, I'll just mention in light of the, the presentation from Mick earlier, online there are copies of, we did a report on domestic violence and child welfare, getting the balance right, specifically about non-molestation orders, which were talked about earlier. So, thank you. Hang on a second. Just, um, oh. Oh. Has yeah. anybody, we could probably have time for just a couple of questions, yeah. if anybody wanted to ask anything. Should you the, change the slogan from... Fathers need, children need fathers to children need both parents. Yes, of course. Well, we are both parents matter and we absolutely support that. And I don't deny, by the way, that there are some very violent men who, and, and, and children and mothers, everybody needs to be kept safe. Everybody needs to be kept safe. Um, but absolutely, but you know, the children need and benefit from both parents. And I mean, I knew somebody, by the way, I'll just give you a little example, whose father was an alcoholic. And he used to be quite violent when he was an alcoholic. And eventually, um, his, his wife, they actually remained married, um, basically said, that's it, you're out, unless you, uh, well, you're out. At which point, he immediately stopped drinking, never touched a drop till the day he died, many yeah. years later, was an exemplary father. I know his daughter, um, their daughter. And, yes. and she, she absolutely adores both of her parents, you know? so. Yes, and it's not as simple as both you and previous speakers made out that you can get uh, molestation orders and others just like that. Time after time, judges are told not to make ex parte orders. That's the order without notice at all. Okay, thank you, Michael, thank very you. much. Thank you.